Hey, I think we're live. Hey, Welcome, we are. Nice. Um, let's give everyone a few seconds to settle in before we get this started, I say. Yeah, the music was great. I, the music I'm was great. full of energy. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I hope everybody who heard the music is, is full of all, energy. All pumped now. Uh, yes. Probably came yes. from lunch, a little down there, but uh, yeah. Let's... Uh, Let's get this started, maybe. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. only 20 minutes after all, and we will want to yeah. uh, waste too much time. Mm -hmm. um, maybe let's start with a little intro. Hi, I'm Moritz. I work at Contentful, where I lead the team that runs our website, the marketing website. And um, if you happen to not know Contentful yet, uh, we are the leading content platform for digital-first businesses. So what we do, what our product does, is help businesses to unify content into a single hub uh, structure it for any digital channel and integrate with hundreds of complementary tools uh, such as Frosmo. And uh, yeah, over to you, Maya, maybe. That's a good handover. Yeah, thank you, Moritz. So happy to be here. My name is Maya Erkeki. I work for a company called Frosmo. And we're based here in Helsinki, Finland. So hello from the sunny Scandinavia to everyone. Frosmo is the personalization software. So basically our product is is personalizing the visitor experience on any website or e-commerce site. And we've been working with, with Contentful as a partner, I think three years now. And I'm really happy to discuss this, this use case of using personalization for lead generation. And I know we have a lot of B2B marketers in the audience and uh, I've had a lot of questions about B2B. Like, can I use personalization for B2B sites? And uh, definitely, yes, you can. That's what we'll talk about today. Yes, uh, we'll do. And uh, our conversation today is actually connected to a more extensive presentation uh, Maya and I will be giving at WebDagana later this week, Wednesday, 8 a.m. to be specific. And uh, I, I think uh, it's going to be quite insightful. And uh, if you'd like to attend, check the comments for a code that will pop up very soon that gives you uh, a nice 38% of the price, I think. And um, so the presentation uh, we're, we're having there is about a, a personalization project that uh, Maya and I and, and our teams have been working on uh, for the contentful.com website. Um, we started in November. It's still going. And uh, we're, we're looking to share some interesting uh, little details about the process, but also lessons we learned, obviously. And the title of the presentation will be Applying E-Commerce Principles to Content. So also personalization, but a little different viewing angle. Um, because on the one hand, it's one of the personalization strategies that we used in our project. And on the other hand, it's also nicely connected to an to a thought you came up with, Maya, the CFO versus the, the CMO picture. Correct, correct. And I think like when when planning a talk, like creating the the subject, this is always like the tricky part. And we were really doing a lot of back and forth, and and we wanted to start from the high level principles, and and like applying e-commerce principles on on content sites, because if we think of personalization, uh, orchestrating a customer journey, creating personalized recommendations, so e-commerce mm -hmm. sites are are definitely like leading the market. Yeah. Uh, but we wanted to sort of build in this thought that, hey, if you think of any CFO, like if you know any CFOs, you know that they don't allow any extra goods to be sort of stored and uh, tie in capital because, because anything you have in the storage should be utilized as well as possible. Uh, but the same actually applies to content. So all CMOs know that creating the content, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes team's mind share, and really like making most of that content and treating it with the e-commerce principles is, is sort of same as making most of that investment, the investment you've made on those content assets. And uh, yeah. really the angle, if I say a couple more things on the business to business angle, why, why I think that's quite important and why I get so many questions is that often business to business websites have very different visitor personas uh, visiting the site. Like there are the decision makers, uh, developers, or somebody making technical evaluation. Then there is purchasing. And uh, then on the other hand, you might be serving different industries. 
So you might have a site that is serving medical devices and aerospace, and, and you want to make sure that the site experience is relevant for both. So, uh, and, and obviously now all this changes with B2B sales, travel restrictions. So personalizing the site experience is, is becoming increasingly important on, on business to business. I'm so happy, Moritz, that you're willing to share what you've learned about it, because it's still, I would say, kind of new in the market. It was new to us, definitely, uh, yeah. as a team and applying that uh, to our specific problem, which is mm. basically just what you, what you described. Mm -hmm. um, the past minute, um, because we, yes, we do have a website with digital project uh, product, and then people go to the website to to learn about the product, to to eventually hopefully sign up for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so the website is one of our main assets. But just as you say, um, the audience towards like uh, addressed by that website is very diverse. We, mm -hmm. we have a very technical product on the one hand. Um, so it's used by a lot of technical people, developers who have very specific needs and questions. And then, um, yeah, we have all these other people also being touched by, by Contentful as a product. So if you think about a product that, that creates a hub for your content, there's people writing content, creating content, orchestrating content. That's another group of people we need to address. There's people making the strategic decisions about investing in technology. So we have those decision makers and it's very diverse and it's really hard to address everyone with the same message because they care about completely different things. And this was, this was basically the main motivation why we um, decided to go into, yeah, uh, a personalized approach for our own website. Um, it was really fun to, to explore and uh, to learn while, while we start doing things. Which was, I think, the most the most challenging part of it because, like, we we didn't have a plan, we didn't have too much experience. We just started doing it, and uh, together with with the people at Frostmo, especially Maya, um, started developing approaches that might work for us in 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 very very different ways. Yeah, that's great, and I think what you had about the approach was really nice that we sort of ended ha up having these quite balanced use cases. It was initially sort of starting with, with small steps, uh, but then you had very nicely, like you're doing the rule-based personalization and algorithm-based personalization, and it all kind of evolved along the way. You know, uh, sometimes if you go more in the waterfall mode, you really define everything you do, but this was more like step-by-step and maybe you want to share a bit more about how, how you started learning, learning along yeah. the way and, and what worked and what didn't. Yeah, happy to. So, uh, yeah, like we, we started the conversation and, and immediately saw the potential in, in going ahead with uh, like a Frostmo implementation and, and looking what we can do, especially in terms of um, using all that really relevant and interesting content we have on the website. It's it's huge when you look at it in, in like amounts of content, uh, blog articles, technical documentation, lots of assets such as white papers. And, and so we wanted to make that accessible to people who care about each thing in a meaningful way without like serving everything to everyone, making them search super long, these kind of things, because the more relevant the experience gets for the people, the, the more likely they are to establish uh, that this product might be for them, which it was, which is basically what it's about when we come to to lead generation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what we what we did instead of creating this huge complex strategy was just see, okay, what's the basic information we need to get started? Looking at okay, what are the main assets we we would like to push because we see. Uh, most potential there, how do we address different user groups and how do they currently behave, like looking at analytics, trying to figure out, okay, this section of the website might be interesting for this uh, persona group, etc. And then as soon as we had a rough understanding, we just started by, by shipping a first modification to see how that turns out to work and, and what we can learn from that. And then look at data, look at behavior, try something else, try something else, add something on top of that, and really iterate our way towards um, a somewhat sophisticated setup that we have now, mm -hmm. just a few months uh, later, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
definitely. And uh, initially when we spoke about this, it was kind of a massive big thing and uh, difficult to difficult to know where to start. What, what would you say were the sort of main lessons you learned on the way? So aside, like the first one being um, maybe very simply that what I already mentioned, uh, just start doing something, like mm -hmm. come up with a hypothesis, come up with an experiment, and then just ship something to learn, iterate mm -hmm. your way to more information, to more knowledge, and to towards a better uh, solution. So this really experiment driven uh, approach without trying to predict the outcome of everything we do mm -hmm. just be open to see oh th that might work that doesn't work let's try a different strategy etc so that was one thing we learned was very valuable but it's also very much in, th in sync with how we work anyway so that that was a good thing mm -hmm. then there was uh, a very big chunk of of let's say insights and challenges also around the the theme of modularity i would say mm -hmm. modularity in terms of is our front end and design uh setup modular enough to to reshuffle a page to to change content bits to really personalize the experience aside from maybe just changing a headline which is not really the point mm -hmm. Um, but also is our content modular, is our metadata uh, supporting the modularity, like the reuse and recycling of, of content that we want to, to surface to the user. And um, on that end, like our content obviously is super modular and uh, well-structured because we're using our own product for the website. So Contentful has a very structured data set up um, so we could easily pull bits and pieces like individual teasers, content bits, assets, combine them into personalized experiences with Frostmo. So that wasn't a problem. But on the metadata structure, th th there still could be some more thinking about, uh, especially the, the, the third challenge I, I want to bring up as well, which is segmentation. And it's sometimes really, really tricky to assign certain content pieces or certain certain assets to specific user groups like on a strategic level but also to really understand who you have in front of you um on the on the website because mm -hmm. thinking of groups like like um developers for example it's pretty straightforward they um you would find them on the developer blog articles you would find them on technical documentation pages easy to identify easy to to segment but what about a content creator or someone leading a team of people working on digital products or like a CMO? What what content specifically would only they read and no one else? And how how to find these groups and how to define these groups was quite quite a challenge and quite interesting, I would say. Mm -hmm. So that's a big learning. Like really, segmentation isn't always super easy and takes a bit of time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one way to sort of get away from the segmentation challenge is the other use case that you selected. So you, in addition to this, okay, this is the content we'll show to this segment. Uh, you also did this yeah. algorithm driven recommendations, yeah. which basically then don't, don't require you to define the segments or the content. Is there a few things you can mention about those? Yeah. So uh, yeah, on, on the one hand, we had this rule-based setup, like if you are yeah. in group X, you get something else, uh, hopefully more relevant um, to engage more. And the other thing we did was, uh, and this brings us back to the whole e-commerce topic, um, we set up our blog content to be tracked in a, in a slightly different way than before. Um, meaning in, instead of article views, we would like, like consider things product views which immediately then allowed us to, to um, leverage all the e-commerce functionality that comes with Frosmo. And uh, as you all know, product recommendation is pretty like mainstream these days and pretty refined. And uh, so we used that, that background uh, and, and tool set to then start surfacing um, reading recommendations to blog visitors. So as soon as they, they had clicked around like a couple of like maybe three, four articles on the blog, the system would start building an affinity profile and then only surface a content that is relevant to that profile and completely automatically. So we're not curating article lists for anyone. Like the whole system works automatic, automated and just gives people what they 
what they most likely are looking for. And that really helped us um, drive up engagement numbers on, on those recommendations, I must say. I think that's a great lesson and that's an advice I would give to anyone. So finding the balance between these different types of use cases and then as Moritz said, really tracking the results, like which ones actually have better performance because you can track that uh, which user groups, for example, then convert better. And in this case, conversion meaning, for example, living in, in their contact details. So I, I think those were great lessons learned. Um, I guess everybody's really interested uh, on the results. So, so did you, Moritz, actually get more leads since that was the big topic? I, I had a lot of people joining the session because they, they really wanted to tackle, tackle the challenge of lead generation. So what would you say about those? Um. Yes, the short answer is yes. Uh, it, it made a very positive uh, impact um, to our like lead generation flow. It's it's not like it's not radically different than anything else we did, but it's like a very solid improvement. And um, without giving specific numbers, because obviously I won't share those, um, we have like repeatedly noticed certain patterns. Um, and one pattern is that that. Uh, as opposed to just generic teasers that we put in front of people. Um, personalized teasers, so they could be personalized based on, on who you are or personalized based on those those um, content recommendations, um, have much higher engagement rates. So our click rates are, are up to, on average, between like 150% uh, up to 500% in, in certain areas, just like clicking on content recommendations we make uh, to people. That's one thing, like definitely good impact there, lots of engagement. Um, but more interestingly, even, even people who just saw a personalized recommendation, um, for, for those people, even for those we saw an increase in conversion rate. Conversion for us meaning they are, they're filling out a lead generation form, for example, by loud, downloading a gated asset or, or filling out a contact form. That's a conversion in, in our case here. And um, for people just having seen, like had in front of their eyes, one of the personalized recommendations, those numbers went to 150% as well. So that's that's a very solid bump in, in conversion yeah. just by adding personalization on a B2B con like website. It's not yeah. a consumer yeah. brand or something. I, I think that's amazing. And that's I, I, I saw the numbers as well. I'm like, whoa, just seeing this makes them feel that, hey, these guys have something relevant for me to offer. So. I think amazing results. And I heard that you're going forward all the time. So small steps <laughs> toward the bigger target, just uh, releasing some new, new stuff right away. But yes. I think we're pretty much out of time on this one. Uh, so this discussion, I, I think it's super interesting. I'm always happy to, to learn more. Uh, but uh, did we have anything else we wanted to add? Um, I think that if we queue the last slide, uh, there's a little call to action there. So. This topic is very complex. We've learned a lot. Um, maybe maybe two things. A, if you if you have time, if you're interested, uh, join us at Web Dagana on uh, Wednesday. And if you don't have time, and uh, like then, uh, feel free to really get in touch. Uh, happy to share more details. Um, there's a lots of lots of insights to share and lots of questions to be answered. I'm I'm pretty sure. Yes. See you there. Looking forward to all the questions and feedback. Thanks, Moritz. Thank you, Maya. And I think that's... Uh...